is an ancient civilization. It is also the origin, the origin of humankind is discovered in Ethiopia. So all of our ancestors, our ancestor comes from Ethiopia. Uh, <coughs> Ethiopia is a place where you find an old history and old civilization like the Aksumite civilization, the uh, obelisk that you find in Aksum tells you how far the Ethiopian civilization goes back in history. And uh, the Rokhim Church of Lalibela is one of the architectural wonders that one has to visit. And of course, the natural beauty of Ethiopia. Africa is represented in Ethiopia. You will see the culture, the wildlife, the natural beauty, and therefore, I'm sure John and his team will inform you more from their field experience. Um, another one of the highlights is the Holy Trinity Cathedral um, in Addis. And again, sort of when you're there, and you'll obviously meet Darian a bit, his knowledge, and as he takes you around Addis, there's just sort of plenty to see. Um, and the other thing, which actually he wasn't quite so keen for us to get out of the bus and have a look at, is the Mikato, which is the largest market in Africa. It covers about four and a half square miles, and you seriously can lo get lost in there for hours. And so Dario, with his group, was going, right, everyone stick together, follow me, no one one leave me, all hold hands. Um, but it was fascinating walking through the spices and they sell everything there from old Coke bottles to donkeys. I mean, you name it, you can buy it there. After that, we fly up to Gonda. And again, Gonda, I was sort of really surprised about. This is um, King Facilidus. This is a um, castle there. Um, and it's in the royal enclosure. And there are actually six castles there. Um, and each king emperor, as they came along, they built their own castle. And so it's this most amazing compound. And in some ways, it really reminded me of sort of Britain and the castles with the turrets. Um, but each king made their own little stamp on it. And there's actually a lion enclosure there, where the last king built his enclosure and put in a couple of black manes, Abyssinian lions. And apparently, the last lion left the enclosure back in 1992, um, when he sadly died. Um, but I couldn't believe it. You know, the enclosure is small, and you just can't believe that they were there until 1992. Um, moving on, this is um, another site in Gondor. It's about two miles away. Um, it is King Facilitus' pools. And when we were there, as you can see, there's no one there um, and it's empty. But during the Tim Cat Festival, which Dario will cover a little bit more of later, it's full of water and everyone's there for the big sort of ceremonies and to get um, a lot of them sort of jumping in the water and swimming across the app all very entertaining and this is and I've now gone and forgotten the name of this place the final place which is Deborah Baran Salati which is in Gonda there are about 44 churches that were built there most of them were destroyed um, back in the end of the 19th century um, this remains standing untouched and apparently the rumour has it it's untouched because when Gonda was under attack there was a swarm of bees and they didn't go in and destroy the church. So that is why it's still standing. But the most important and significant thing is actually the ceiling of the church, which is absolutely incredible. It is stunning, and that's the one thing I think in through all the churches and the different is the artwork and the paintings that you'll see throughout, and all of them tell stories. And I think there's something about 80 cherub heads on the ceiling in the church. It's absolutely stunning. And you can literally stand. I mean, we all got quite dizzy sort of looking up and um, the other thing which <laughs> sort of Gonda is part of the trip that we do, but again it's one of the things that you can do elsewhere, I mean we actually went in Bahada, is to go to basically one of the Ethiopian music bars and they are so much fun, it very much is sitting on old beer crates and it's I think the Ethiopian's version really of a comedy club. They sort of, if you're sitting at the front, they'll pull you up, get you dancing. I mean, poor Lukey and I were sort of on the dance floor, left, right and centre, sort of as we were in there. Um, but they're singing and they're telling the story about you. So they're sort of making up and sort of making jokes about you. As, and so as a tourist, it's quite difficult because you don't understand what they're saying and everyone's laughing and looking at you. But it does, it, you know, with a few beers, it you know, becomes quite an entertaining night. After that, we move on to the Simeon Mountains, which, as you can just see, are breathtaking. Um, you go up into the Simeon Mountains, there's basically one road that goes through. And on our different trips, we, we actually, on this particular one, we just go for a sort of afternoon walk. And 
you've got the option, I mean you can if you don't want to walk you can take a mule, but really the walking is the breathtaking part because you are walking along the escarpments with these incredible views below you and you just feel like you're a million miles away, it is absolutely breathtaking um, and the other thing that's there is the gelato baboon and I didn't really kind of, I've seen baboon in Africa before and didn't really think anything of it and as we were walking along we came across one, two and we were like, oh wow photo opportunity and for the next hour we sat there and we probably had 200, 300 baboon all around us or just literally sort of two feet away and it was just an incredible experience. But the other two things that you've got there are the simian fox and the lamagaya vulture which Johnny had great pleasure in telling me this morning is it's a carrier rather than a bird of prey, is that right? Yeah. Carrion, sorry and basically so they'll pick up the bones after the other so birds of prey have been in and killed and they'll pick up the bones, take them up to a great height and drop them on the rocks to break up the bones so they can eat the bone marrow so there you go, a little bit of fact about the lamagaya vulture uh, the other thing that I loved about the Simeon Mountains is the well behaved kids these kids were brilliant, they saw us coming as we were walking along and they were there and they set up their little sort of stand of, sort of goodies that they want to sell um, and <laughs> As you go forward and you pick up something, the one child that was responsible for that hat will come forward and you know, talk about the price. And then if you say no, 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 they'll go and sit back down and wait for you to pick up the next thing. And it's very well organised and probably the only time you'll have that experience in Ethiopia because otherwise everything's being sort of pushed into your hands. But as you can see, we did buy a few hats along the way. Um, from there we actually drive up as part of our group tour a lot of people fly from go back to Gondor, fly up to Axum but we actually drive from the Simeon Mountains up to Axum and it is meant to be one of the most beautiful roads in the world and I have to say it seriously is it was stunning um, we drove, it is quite a hard drive you know, 10 to 12 hours it really depends on, there are road works going along the way so if they're blasting a bit of road you might have to sit, have a bottle of water on the side of the road, take a few photos, go for a wander, but it's really worth the drive, and although it sounds quite painful, that sort of amount of time in the car, so worth it. I mean, you know, these are just some of the views that we had from there. And then we end up in Axum, which, I mean, there's so much history here, it is unbelievable, I'm not even going to go into it, but this is apparently where the Ark of the Covenant is. So all of us, as we got there, the sort of Indiana Jones kind of feeling within us kind of came alive, and we were very lucky that, um, and this is the Senai Fields, but we were very lucky, and I just want to share, Sise, the guy on the right, was our local guide in Axum, and he everyone in the group that I was with just said he brought the place alive. You, when you met him and he's there in his leather jacket and his sunglasses you kind of think he's not going to know much about history and he just talked throughout the day with so much passion and it really came across and if you go to Axum I would highly recommend him as a guide because he really does um, bring it alive for you. Finally, we go on to the Tigray region. So we're right up in the northern parts. And this is where you really get your first experience of the sort of rock hewn churches. And there are 200 odd churches up there. And it really is take your pick. They're all active churches. And it really depends on how much physical exercise you want to do. There are some that you can only go there if you're a man. Um, and one particular one, you have to climb up a rope ladder, which is a, basically a piece of rope, a leather rope, which is about 15 metres. So you've got to be pretty fit and pretty brave to kind of shimmy your way up there um, so, so you know the different rock churches that we choose to get up there you know there's some hard walking some that are straight off the road and it's very easy so it really is a case of take your pick because all is stunning all tell their own story and all worth a visit it's just the time to actually see them all so yeah this is uh, climbing up through the trees to get to one of the churches um, and again one of the things that's I say this because I suppose I used to be a World Frontiers client before I actually worked for them, is the great thing is the sort of little added extras that you get. And because you're a small group, you're able to do it. And our local guide up in the Guralta region, he just says, we're having a party tomorrow. We've got a bit of a religious ceremony going on tomorrow. Dad's basically making some local, te you know, some homemade tej, the local honey mead. Why don't we all go back to my house and have a drink? And so off we went, and we're sitting in his parents' house, drinking tej, just kind of thinking, where did that come from? So, I mean, it is, it's amazing, and those experiences, and actually it started raining while we were there, so another glass got poured, and we waited for the rain to clear. Um, so it was fantastic, a really brilliant experience. And then 
on to Lalabella, which has got to be the highlight, I suppose, of Ethiopia. If you're going to go to Ethiopia, I think you've got to go to Lalabella. And it really is. The rock hewn churches are just incredible. This is St. George's. And they, you can spend hours just walking through them, having a look. And sort of, there are so many corridors. Oh, that's not working. A little sort of pass between the church that you can... I mean, it is a little maze going through them. But absolutely stunning. And this Lalabella has this just... I can't quite describe it. An amazing feeling to it. And sort of the hotel we were staying is right on the escarpment. So you've got incredible views and you've got the churches. And then we went to... Um, someone's house and we went in and had a sort of coffee ceremony as you've seen going on at the back um, very similar so it's just one of those places that is a must and the priests in all the different churches love getting out their wares really whether it's sort of old ancient manuscripts their crosses some of them sort of get slightly nervous of the flashes of camera so as they get out their cross they put on their sunglasses and sort of stand there um, but it is absolutely amazing and just so worth a visit I mean obviously they're now all UNESCO sites so you do have over most of them the shrouding to protect them but in some ways it doesn't really sort of take it away I mean I know there's been talk about changing how they cover them to try and get away from the pillars that you can see but brilliant final bit of our trip is Tesva and this is a guy called Mark Chapman who used to guide for Wild Frontiers out in Ethiopia and he set up Tesva which is, and I'm now going to actually look this up because I can't remember because it's a big mouthful where is it? Tesva stands for Tourism in Ethiopia for Sustainable Future Alternatives um, and actually in Amharic Tesva stands for hope and I think that sort of basically sums it up really um, Mark set it up and it's working with local communities to give them opportunity and from point of view of what we're doing is we're going out and we're walking out into the communities staying within the communities and they're feeding us they've built huts for us and the huts are incredible so right down on the escarpment so you've got these incredible views and staying with the families I mean it's sort of quite basic facilities but you're walking for sort of 15 to 20 kilometers a day but it's easy walking in a sense it's pretty flat because you're going along the escarpment but it is just and the sort of families as you kind of come into the little villages and they're you know tending to their crops or whatever and you really get a feel of proper Ethiopia as far as I'm concerned and every single one of our the people that were on the trip that I did said that this was a highlight of it it was absolutely worth it and we're very lucky to work with Mark and Tesfa and offer this and as well as sort of in Lalabella we've got a couple of other opportunities different harder walking so there's places up in Tigray which is part of our Danakil trip um, and we also are hoping to do a new walk in February which is another Tesfa walk but it'll be sort of a whole week's walking as part of the community um, so these are the local guys that are with you walking um, and they Again, if you don't want to walk, you've got the opportunity of a pony. And I mean, the pony that they brought out for us was decked out, ready for a wedding. It was unbelievable. They were so pleased that someone was going to pay to use their horse. And it was a real honour. And I was given the task, as the rider of the group, to actually ride their pony. And I've never been so humiliated all my life because they wouldn't actually let me do anything myself. So I wasn't even allowed to pick up the reins. Um, but anyway, it was a lot of fun. And as you can see, so in the evening, the parties get going. I mean, when we were there, they um, killed a goat for us, and the whole village came in, and we danced and partied throughout the night, really. And finally, as the trip, we move on to Bahadar, and this is two guys that are crossing the lake to get their wood to market, and apparently it's taken about five, six hours to get across, so they set off early hours. Um, but as part of the tour, we go across the lake, go to a couple of monasteries and have a look, and again, it's all about the sort of paintings that are in these monasteries they are stunning and they all tell a story and you can spend hours looking at them trying to understand the stories being explained to them so really worth and the final thing is the Blue Nile Falls and it is one of those things I have to say occasionally might be the Blue Nile Trickle um, because there's not necessarily guaranteed a lot of water um, and when we were there we had a sort of I think an average showing of water but, so I would never sort of say prepare for lots but you know hopefully you'll have some
nothing about Ethiopia. I wasn't planning on going through it, so I hadn't really read much about it. It was only when I was there that I realized just what a huge treasure trove this country was, completely unique in sub-Saharan Africa for the depth of recorded and tangible culture, history. The landscapes were absolutely majestic. Um, And it was so far removed from the world that I was expecting the world of the 1980s or the the perception of the 1980s that I was absolutely staggered.